kind of the layout of my talk is I really want to, uh, metaphorically speaking, of course, put my arms around all of you and walk you back 15 years into my past. And when we get there, I'm 15 years old, I want to act as your guide and walk you through my life. And while I'm doing that, I would hope that you would take notes. And when you're taking notes, I would hope that you would take notes selfishly. Don't take notes about what John Crane was doing. Nobody cares about that, <laughs> except for maybe my mom, okay? But besides my mom, there's really no one that cares about that, or should they? I want you to selfishly take notes from the standpoint of what can you steal from my experience and use for yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so as a matter of background, I grew up in a town called Armonk, New York. And if anybody knows Armonk, somebody's laughing. Um, well, how do you know Armonk? My aunt lives there. Ar okay. Well, I grew up there, and Armonk is best known for being the town where the global headquarters for the IBM Corporation is located in Armonk, New York. Um, so I grew up there. My dad, uh, he was the sole wage earner and supported my family, and he worked at IBM. He was an analyst for the sales division, and then uh, my mom, she stayed home and she took care of me and my sister. And life was good. So I'm growing up, I'm about 13 years old, I decide that having money is good, so I start mowing lawns. I noticed a pattern with people that would move into my neighborhood. They would move up from the city, from Manhattan, they'd buy a house which had a lawn that was about the size of an acre, which is a good size, and they would all say the same things to themselves. They'd say, wow, I'm going to buy a lawnmower because it'll be great. I'll save money and I'll get exercise and, and that'll be great. And that experiment usually lasted about half a summer. And then they would hire a lawn service. Um, so I noticed this pattern and I knew a bunch of my neighbors all had lawnmowers in their garages that were just collecting dust. So me at the age of 13 knocked on their door and said, hey, I could mow your lawn, I'll use your lawn mower, and all I need you to do is make sure there's gas, you pay me $12. And I got three or four lawn jobs that way, and so as a young kid walking around with about 50 bucks a week, life was good. So then when I was 15, <clears throat> when I was 15 years old, I really wanted to be an adult. I, got, I just couldn't wait to be a grown up. And my next door neighbor, who was one of my uh, lawn customers, Charles Shapiro, he uh, had his own business. He was a real estate consultant, and he owned his own company. He had a partner, and he had two employees. And I don't understand, like, thinking back on it, I can't believe I did this, but I went to him and told him that I thought it would be a good idea that for the summer he should have me work in his company. Like, I'm a 15-year-old kid. Now, around that time, personal computers were just starting to become used in business, and I really liked computers, so I kind of knew how to work them, but I didn't know anything about using a computer in a business. But that did not deter me. I explained it to him in a way where I don't know either through uh, imp that he was impressed or that he was amused. He decided, what the heck, why not? So. Every morning that summer, I would get up, I'd put on dress pants, a white shirt and a tie and a blazer, and I'd go to work for Charles Shapiro at his real estate company. Uh, so nine to five, and lunchtime, I would go down. It was uh, downtown White Plains is the local city where he his company was, and I would go to lunch. And I'm sitting there amongst 30 year olds who are having lunch, and I emulated their behavior. I dressed like them, I acted like them, and I was really doing well. He was paying me $5 an hour, which back then was double the minimum wage. The minimum wage was $2.35. Man, that makes me sound ancient. <laughs> um, sorry, the digression there just kind of hit me. Um, yes? Was it a real estate company like realtors, or was it like a real estate like mortgages? It was real estate consulting to major corporations. His company was really cool. What they did was they did analyses for companies that were considering relocating offices. 
So they would take into all accounts like demographics, percentage of how many people would actually make the move, and then people that didn't make the move, what the severance would have to be, so there's that cost. And then is there an employee base where they're gonna move to that they could then hire from? Um, it, was really, it, was, it was really interesting work, for, uh, especially for a high school student, because where else would I have gotten that experience? So <coughs> one of his clients was Merrill Lynch. Anybody here know Merrill Lynch? So uh, I guess I impressed him to some degree. So Merrill Lynch is a big client for a small company. And he says, hey, I've got a client meeting today with Bernie May of Merrill Lynch. He's the senior vice president of real estate. Uh, why don't you come with me? So we rode the train down into Manhattan and go up to the you know, 50th floor of this big tall building in Wall Street. And there I'm sitting there and the meeting's going on and I'm petrified because I'm afraid that somebody's gonna ask me a question. And uh, so we get through the meeting and at one point Bernie May of Merrill Lynch turns to me and he goes, hey, uh, are you still in school? What do you think he meant? Like yeah, he meant college. I said, uh, yeah, because I didn't want to you know, reveal, because I didn't know what Charles had told him or not. And uh, he says, oh, where are you going to college? I'm like, well, I, I don't quite know yet. I'm still in high school. Uh, and so he uh, enthusiastically exclaimed that he had no idea that I was 15 years old and enthusiastically meant there was some swear words mixed in with his uh, surprise. But, uh, but anyway, that was a really great experience. So I'm living the summer as an adult. So I, I really wanted that and I was getting this great experience. I had the freedom. I'd go out at lunchtime. I was making $5 an hour, which in today's dollars is about $18 an hour, using in about 3% inflation. Um, so life's pretty good for John Crane. And then guess what happened? September. I had to go back to school. So there I am. I've been living like an adult for a whole summer. And now there I am in 10th grade English. Oh, you got to be kidding me. I just wanted to get out of there. But I couldn't, you know. I had to just kind of let it run its course. So during the school year, I was a student. I was part of the track team, did well in a couple of races, went to the prom. It was all great, right? Then I go on to college. I go to Susquehanna University for four years, graduate. Now it's 1994. I'm back home back in Armonk, and now I get to be an adult full time. If I want to be, I'm done with school forever, right? So just, uh, you know, most young men, whether they realize it or not, uh, they want to kind of be like their dad. So my dad worked for a major Fortune 500 company, so I went out and got a job with a major Fortune 500 company. I got hired by this company called Sprint. Uh, Sprint had a residential customer service department uh, in Purchase, New York, which was just south of where I lived, and that was my first job right out of college. The internet around that time was just starting to take hold. The internet companies were just starting to start up, so telecommunications was somewhat related to all that, so Sprint was kind of a hot place to work. And I decided, you know what, this seems pretty good. They're treating me pretty well. They're paying me pretty well. So I'll just kind of build my career here. So they hired me in, in 1994, I was making $20,500 a year. That was my, my, on my original offer letter. So <coughs> I had this strategy every time I started a new job. I would find the two or three people in, each de in my department that were doing really well. And I would talk to them, and I would watch them, and I would just do what they did. This would be something you might want to write down for yourselves. I would do what they did, and I got promoted really quickly. So I spent exactly a year in residential customer service. I got moved to rest in Virginia to business customer service, and I did that for exactly a year. And then I got my first big promotion to business sales in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Now, now it's 1996. I'm sitting on my couch in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and 
I've gone from making my salary at business customer service was 25,000, now my salary is 55,000. So I took that job because I wanted the money. What was everybody telling me to do? What was the advice that I was getting? What am I, what's more important than anything else? They were telling, enjoy my job is what I should have been listening to, but instead I was listening to make as much money as possible. Make as much money as possible. Don't worry whether or not you like it. Has anybody heard that advice? Or is this, I'm seeing a lot of no's and that kind of surprises me. Can you, I, so how many people here have heard the advice, just make as much money as possible? How many people have been told, don't worry about the money, just follow your passions? Okay, wow, that really surprised me. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. You guys are much further along than I thought. Okay, so I was following the advice of make as much money as possible. The cracks in the foundation of my plan were just starting to show and I didn't realize it yet. So I'm sitting there on my couch, it's July of 1996 and I'm really unhappy. I don't like my geography and I'm really not sure if I like my job. And so I'm sitting on my couch and I'm like, okay, I gotta figure out how to get happy and so I sat down and made up a plan. And this is an actually a copy of the actual plan from July of 1996. And on this plan, I've got short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. And the goals are basically return to Northern Virginia. You know, I, I just, Kalamazoo, I'm glad that some people like it. It just wasn't for me. Um, I wanted to own my own home. I wanted to begin my master's degree program and I wanted a family. What I really wanted was to be married, but at that moment, sitting in Kalamazoo all by myself, I really didn't have any prospects, and at that point, I actually believed that I actually had like negative prospects, like that there was probably more people out there that didn't want to marry me, right? So, <coughs> not, not a great mental place, right? So, uh, I wrote up my plan, and I sat down, and I said, okay, I'm gonna execute against that plan. Five years go by. So five years go by, it's now March of 2001. I have almost all but completed all of my coursework at George Mason University. So the diploma is basically on the wall at this point. So I've accomplished that. I'm married, I'm married to a woman. I married way out of my pay grade. Um, and hopefully she never figures this out. Um, I do not deserve her, um, but anyway. Um, so I'm married, we own a house, and I drive a really nice car. I've been just pr been promoted to senior national account manager for Sprint Corporation's largest account, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and my salary is $155,000 a year. So by all external, all external measures, like I've won the game, I've done it. People are looking at me and they're like, wow, he's the youngest senior national account manager in the whole company. Wow, he's really got it all together. And inside I'm thinking, I really don't like the job that I now have and I don't know what I'm gonna do about it. When you start a big sales job, the most ideal thing that can happen is, is the former sales representative will then take you around and introduce you to all the, your contacts. So that's where I am at this point in my story. I'm sitting in a Waffle House in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm being inter introduced into my accounts by the account manager, Tom Gibbons. Awesome guy. So Tom Gibbons is leaving and I'm taking his place. We're sitting there in the Waffle House at the booth. He's right there. He's like two and a half feet away from me in this booth. And I'm sitting there, we're talking and he's explaining to me about who we're gonna see that day. What are we gonna be talking about? What are the important issues to the customer? And I'm thinking to myself, I really don't care about any of this. And Tom, Tom, as I said, awesome guy, Tom was 65 years old and he had this big head of like gray, bushy gray hair and a full beard and when he was making his points, he would just, he would like get this wistful look on his face and he would like dab at the, dab at the air. And so I'm sitting there across from him and he's explaining what he's explaining to me and he's making his points. And then 
Has this ever happened to anybody when something hits you in your brain and it's so profound, like all of a sudden, you, like you lose all the senses of your room around you, like all of a sudden like you can't hear? Has that ever happened to anybody other than me? So you see some nodding heads. Yeah, that's what happened to me. All of a sudden, like the entire room faded out. I couldn't hear what he was saying anymore because what I realized in that moment was there was two and a half feet away from us or apart in this booth, but in years, it was 35 years. He was retiring and I was just getting started. I was 30 years old, 35 years. That was longer than I'd been alive at that point. So I'm sitting there and I'm starting to get like really scared because I'm thinking to myself, I do not want to trade the next 35 years of my life away for money. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden Tom starts to come back into view because Tom's looking at me like this. He's like, are you okay? So of course I lied. You know, I said, yes, you know, it's early flight and sorry and, you know. So I, you know, got re-engaged and I showed up for the meetings and I did a good job that day and um, worked really hard. I got home and I remember telling Linda, my wife, I said, I'm not sure I can do this. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I don't know what I would do other than this, but I have to figure that out because I cannot do this for the next 35 years. Just play the game. It's just not in me. So what I did was I kind of launched into this, and I had no book for this. Um, I, I launched into this exercise of trying to answer this one question. And the one question was, I, I get up early. And the one question I wanted to answer was, the alarm clicks on at 545 and you pop out of bed. You just cannot wait to get out of bed to go and do whatever it is that you want to do. That's the, that's the question I wanted to answer. So the first thing that I did was I, I got a, a blank ye yellow pad and I started writing the attributes to the ideal job. So I wasn't thinking about a particular job, I was just thinking about like what the attributes were. So for example, I don't like to be away from my wife. So the job that I, was, I had at Sprint at the time, I was traveling two to three times a month. So the first thing I wrote up at the top of that yellow pad was no travel. No travel, home every night. Um, I wanted to have complete autonomy. I didn't want to have to answer to a boss. I didn't want uh, a boss telling me that, hey, we're going to go in this whole new direction and if I didn't like that direction, then I had to do it anyway. I just didn't want to do that. Didn't want to be in that position. I wanted to be able to choose my customers. Because when you work for a big corporation and they assign you a book of, of clients, uh, at least some of your customers are going to be jerks. You know how I know that? They're people. <laughs> That's just the way it works. Some of them are going to be jerks. Uh, when I started my financial planning practice, I don't know how I came up with this, but one of the things that I say, I always say, is I say, and if I do a really good job for you and you feel like I deserve it, I might like to meet some of the people that you know. But the thing that is most important to me, if anybody that you ever introduce me to, is that they have to be nice. And people always laugh when I say that. I don't know why. Um, but I'm proud to say I've got 160 households that I'm responsible for, and they're all nice. I don't have anybody that I look on my calendar and go, ah, oh, the Smiths are coming in. That never happens to me. I'm very lucky. Is your name Smith? Yeah. Sorry, man. <laughs> I guess I should pick a more unique name. Sorry. Um, so I was, so the, the, the life, the path that I was on and I was achieving against was I was chasing someone else's definition of financial success or, or career success. And I was, I was becoming what uh, I've, I heard somebody say recently, this, this fantastic term, it was called comfortably dissatisfied. That I was, I, was, I was comfortable and I was satisfied enough to kind of just keep going with it but I was more or less dissatisfied, all things being equal, if I won the lottery, the very first thing I would have been doing was quitting that job. 
Um, and that's, that's a tough spot to be in. So I went through this process of trying to identify what that 4.45 a.m. thing I'm going to go do, try and figure that out. So I was working down my list. And as I worked down my list, I would talk to people, friends of mine, people that knew me really well, family members. And I would try and map my list against different uh, roles. And I kept trying, kept trying. And then I came up with the role of financial advisor. And when I got to the role of financial advisor, I'd go to people that knew me well and I'd say, hey, I'm thinking about becoming a financial advisor. Could you see me doing that? And I started hearing, yeah, I could see you doing that. And not only could I see you doing that, but if you actually become a financial advisor, I want you to call me because I want to be one of your first clients. That's when I knew I had figured it out. So that was like a two year period of me working at Sprint, not liking it, and just kind of, you know, every day going in there, going through the motions. And so one day I'm sitting in my cube. They have cubes in corporate America. I'm sitting there in my cube. My computer's here, and there's a little desk area here. I'm just like looking at the ceiling. I'm like, oh my God, I got to get out of here. And all of a sudden I had this thought popped into my head. And the thought that popped into my head was, if I could have my own financial planning business in Old Town Alexandria, which was like a mile from my house, that I could walk to. So I didn't even have to use my car. Like if I could, if I could have that, like that would be so great. And as soon as I had that thought, it, scared, it was so big, it became so important to me, it sounded so awesome, it scared me. And instantly my brain went into overdrive telling me all the reasons why that could never happen. But more on that later. So I want to talk a little bit about this thing, self-awareness. Self-awareness, <clears throat> and what I'm really talking about is unique ability or unique gift or unique talent special talent, people have different words for this. Everybody in here has something within them that is really like great. Like you're, you're better at than anybody else is. It's just this natural thing that you've got. And I wasn't using mine when I was at Sprint. I was forcing myself to be good at something that I, I didn't have any love for. So there was always all this tension, right? So going through that process that I went through, as, as you know, ridiculous as my process was, but I ultimately got to that place where my unique abilities lined up with this career financial advisor, and that's why I'm excited to get out of bed in the morning. It's easiest to see in the world of entertainment and athletics. So if you think about like the tennis player Venus Williams, or the swimmer Michael Phelps, the entertainer Bruno Mars, the basketball player, you don't like Bruno Mars? I love Bruno Mars. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I, I, said, I don't know you, so I saw your face, I was like, it's either really good or really bad. The basketball player, LeBron James, right? All of them have mapped some special gift that's inside of them, and they've wrapped, and they're, they're also passionate about it. You gotta have those two. Special gift, they're passionate about it, and they've wrapped special education and coaching around it. They've gone out and got the best coaching and the best teachers around them. And the last component of that is hard work. And they work really hard to make themselves great. Like that's why they're great, is because they're willing to go out and put in the time. They're willing to run the miles. And if they weren't passionate about it, and if it wasn't a unique talent, they're never going to be able to put in the time. It's like, is anybody here like, I, I always, this is my most recent example, but some people really hate this team, like Tom Brady, right? It's like, anybody here like passionately hate Tom Brady? Okay, I got two, all right, so sorry man, just, just go with me here. <clears throat> like, I don't really like him either, but he's amazing. I mean, he's a fantastic quarterback. He's won five Super Bowls, and he's been in, what, six or seven, right? He's pretty good. But if somebody came to me when I was 10 years old and they had the book on how to win five Super Bowls, 
all the workouts, all the people you got to go, all the teams you got to be on, everything you got to do to be Tom Brady. And they said to John Crane, here you go, man, you're 10 years old, you do what's in this binder and you will win a Super Bowl, at least one. I wouldn't have made it through the first month because I don't care about football. I like to watch it, but that's about it. All the workouts, all the hits, all the stuff, the pat, I, I just, I never would have made it. It doesn't matter to me. But in the area of being a financial advisor or teaching, like that's something I really enjoy. It lines up with who I am, communicating. So that I'm willing to spend the time at. I'll put in the time. So I share that to say, and this is why I handed out these cards, is I'd like for you to think about your best habits. I gave everybody uh, a card. Everybody's got them. I see a pained look in the audience. Um, you all have them. Um, think about your best habits. I want you to write down three of your best habits, things that you just do naturally well. It's like no, there's, there's really, it takes no energy for you to do these things at all. They're just things that just come to you naturally. And so naturally, and you're so good at them that even like some of your, your friends are like irritated with you. They're just like, man, I just, like, I struggle with that. And you just, just, just do it. It's not fair. Um, that's what I'm looking for, is something like that. So if you can write down like three habits that you have, that things that you just do. And as you fill out your list, like think about it in terms of if you showed that list to somebody that knows you well and you just said, hey, who do, what do you think of this person? They would look at the three habits and they go, well, that's you. That's just you. So while you're writing, like one of the clues for me was I, I was a terrible student in high school and not much better in college. I very rarely ever studied. And one of the classes that I took was organizational behavior. It was my junior year at Susquehanna University, organizational behavior. I never cracked the textbook once. I got a B plus. One of my fraternity brothers failed that class. He was really irritated with me. And he said, you didn't even read the book. And I said, well, it's easy. I mean, you know, they have a problem in the workplace and they just need to do this, 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 and this to make it right and that's what they should just do. It's not that hard. <coughs> it's just something that comes naturally to me. It just makes sense. So organizational behavior, uh, and then I went on to take the advanced class and I got an A in it. Same thing. It just makes sense to me. Uh, and I'm guessing that you all have classes like that too, that you just walk in there and it just, it just happens for you. So is there a junior or a senior in here that would be willing to share from your seat? Come on, help me out. I will. You will? Thank you. Okay. What's your, what's your name? Myasha. Myasha. Okay. Does people in the room know you relatively well? Yes. <laughs> okay. So for Myasha. I want you all to think about Myasha, and I want you to think about things that she does naturally well, that you admire about her, that she, you just look at her and you're just like, and, and maybe it's something that even, she does it so well it irritates you. Like what, what would you say her natural talents are? Somebody. Excuse me? Tells it like it is. Tells it like it is. She's honest. She's a great dancer. What else? She can cook well. She can cook well. <coughs> what else? I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that. But what else? 
some other unique talents, unique skills, anything in the world of academia or in the work environment, the things that she does for your fraternity. What did you say? Okay, anything else? <coughs> okay, would you mind sharing? What did you have on your card? Um, I said that I make people laugh. Okay. I have quick comebacks. <laughs> okay, what else? And I would say that that plays here too with team player. So your natural strengths, from what I'm hearing, and this is just like scratching the surface of you, right? So your natural strengths lend themselves well to working and playing well with others, which is supremely important in corporate America. Because there are a lot of people, it may surprise you, that don't play well with others. Um, so being in any kind of a leadership role or anything like that, those are really key skills. So um, what I would tell you to do, and this is that people see you as honest, like that's big, that's really big. So my, what I would encourage you to do is to kind of flesh that out, mm -hmm. is to really try and see, um, you know, why people say that about you um, and, and truly try and drill into that and look for career opportunities where this is at the core because this is what makes the names that I listed, like people like Venus Williams or Bruno Mars so great, is because we pay hundreds of dollars to go watch them perform. And what are we doing, really? We're watching them, they're, they're, they're giving their fullest expression of self. When Bruno Mars is on stage, is he thinking about his next vacation? Is he like, man, I can't wait for this performance to be over because you know, I got better things to do. Is he thinking that? No. He's blissful. That guy is one heck of an entertainer. I love watching that guy. And the reason why I love watching him is because he's so excellent. He's so great in that moment. It makes me feel better about myself. Right? So in that space, he's playing with a stacked deck because his natural abilities lend itself well to doing that. So for you, it's stack the deck in your favor. Figure out where these things line up for you in a career. And life will be good. Does that make sense? Thanks, guys. So I gave everybody three cards. So you're probably wondering, what's with the three cards? The three cards. Go interview two other people. Right now? Not right now. Oh, <laughs> you want to go to people that know you well. Your friends, you got to know this. Your friends love you. They really do. And they want to make sure that you're happy with them and that you're happy yourself. So you really got to give them, you got to tell them up front, like, I really want you to be honest. I want you to tell me really what you see in me, um, especially if you ask them the opposite question. What are my biggest faults, right? Those are helpful to know, too. But start with your talents. Um, but I would encourage you all to go find other people to interview and start writing, come up with your own list because that will help you tremendously as you start to move into different careers. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? All right, so I'm gonna finish my story here and I'm gonna open it up for question and answer. So where we left off, I was sitting in my cube and I had this thought, like if I could just have this financial planning practice one mile from my house that I could walk to every day, that would be so great. <clears throat> what I didn't, what I, what, what happened during the course of the rest of that year was Sprint was having trouble. Sprint wasn't doing well. And I found out that they were going to be laying people off. So I let the people that talk to the people that make those decisions know that if I got laid off, wouldn't have been too upset about that. 
Uh, Sprint was a very generous company. I knew that they typically gave two weeks severance for every year of service. I had eight years of service, that's 16 weeks. That would help me get started in my new career. So on July 16th of 2002, I got ushered into a conference room. I was told it was part of my review and there was my boss sitting there and he said to me, uh, I'm sorry buddy, you're part of the layoff. He did not know that I didn't want to be there anymore. So imagine his surprise, because I fired people. Firing people stinks. It's, it's telling someone they don't have a job anymore is horrible. So he's just fumbling all over himself. So he tells me that I don't have a job anymore. I'm like, oh. And he's just going on and on and on about, you know, we're really sorry, you know, it's just the company's hiring. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so I sign here and like, we're done, right? And he's just stunned. And he goes, you are taking this really well. I was like, Mike, you've been very generous to me and everything. This is just not a good fit. I just don't want to do this anymore. So I'm going to go do something else. But so thank you. Thank you. Like, this is probably the easiest meeting you're going to have all morning. Um, so I walked out in the parking lot. I drove home. I called my wife on the way home and said, guess what? It happened. I'm done. Went for a three mile run got back to my home office, I took all of the Sprint stuff and I put it on the floor next to the wall and I took out a blank piece of paper and I started building my financial planning business. I never took a day off. So I imagine that, I woke up a senior national account manager and I went to bed a financial advisor. It was great, it was great. So I've been in business now for 15 years and I basically every day for me is like Saturday. I, I, I don't, really think about when my next vacation is. I think about work constantly because I enjoy it. It's just fun for me. And that's really what I want for all of you. Like that's really why I'm here tonight is I wanted to share my story and hoping that you can take some things from it that will help you on your journey so that you can someday have a job or a career or wherever you go and you wake up every day and it's just, life is just fun. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to kind of close three things, <coughs> action items, I guess. Uh, number one is really work on identifying your best habits and really try and figure out what your unique ability, what your unique skills are. That will help you tremendously. There's so many people out there in the workforce that are sitting in jobs that are not inspiring to them they're comfortably dissatisfied, and they're just kind of slugging it out until it's retirement. That's no way to live. Don't do that. Take the time to really learn yourself and find a job that lines up well with that. The second one is probably gonna be the hardest thing that I'm gonna ask you all to do, and that's you gotta be patient. Uh, learning who you are, it takes a lot of time and sometimes you're uncovering truths that lead to other truths and it's just, you know, it's like one of those dolls. Every time you open it up, there's a smaller doll inside. Um, I would encourage you, just keep, keep working at it. Keep working at it. And the last thing is, is once you identify what your unique abilities are and you identify that career or that role, is work hard to be the best at it. If you're the best at it, then you'll enjoy it more, but also, I mean, when anybody ever needs somebody to do that one thing, who are they calling? They're calling you, right. So, thank you very much for allowing me to come share today. Um, I have some business cards up here in case people want to keep in touch with me. Um, and I've got Facebook and Instagram sites if you want to follow me.